entranced by the beautiful harp to really prepare to get up here, so blame it on me. But uh, it is a great week to be at church. It's one of my favorite times of the year. It's the Christmas season, the first week of Advent, all getting excited for what's coming down the road. But there's usually one thing every Christmas that makes me a bit of a Grinch, that gets me in kind of a bad mood, irritated, and I don't enjoy the season as much as I should, at least at the beginning. And that thing is digging out my Christmas decorations. It gets me so frustrated. Now, in Janae and I's home, uh, we live in a home that's not very big. Uh, we don't have a lot of storage space. We don't have a basement, and we have an inaccessible attic. Uh, and so with three kids, storage space becomes pretty limited for Christmas decorations. So we always put them in our crawl space. And I hate the crawl space. I hate it passionately. Let me tell you about this crawl space. First of all, it looks like it was designed for a hobbit because it is so small of an entrance. For a six foot three man to try and get into this thing is literally an Olympic level gymnast, okay? And once you actually get down in there, there's no lights in the crawl space. It's pitch black dark. And you can try and take a flashlight, but I usually have someone dangling it over the top so I can get down. And the, so the first few seconds, minutes of me being in the crawl space, it's just complete darkness. Usually I will get a face full of cobwebs within probably 10 seconds. And then if you've ever been in a crawl space, it's not exactly, unless you've finished it, a really nice area. So I'm crawling through and I'm getting in all kinds of dirt and dust and rocks that kind of hurt a lot, right? I'm not what I used to be, so now kneeling on rocks is very painful for me. Uh, but it's just a nightmare. I hate it. I hate going down there. And it's really all the darkness, right? Like if you could just have a little bit of light, if you could see where you were and get your bearings, if you could take a look at what was in front of you and you didn't have to dig through cobwebs to find your Christmas decorations, it probably would be a little bit of a different experience for me. Because light makes a difference in darkness. Light will change the entire feel of it. And that's what we're talking about really throughout the Advent season is we're talking about light. We're talking about this light that God has sent in the world to illuminate us in the darkness. In a lot of ways, the whole idea of Christmas is based on the light. It's based on the light of God coming into the world. So for the weeks of Advent, we as a church, we're going to read through the first part of John's Gospel, John 1, one of the greatest passages in the Bible. And we're going to look at this theme of light and how Jesus has become our light, that he was our light and he is our light. So if you will, this morning, I just want to read through all the verses that we'll cover in the next four weeks leading up to Christmas. I just want to read this together as a church family and let this sink into our hearts and look at the one who we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas. Let's put that on the screen and read this with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, who, believed, who did receive him, who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you. Such great words, such amazing words to read together as a church family. And to ponder this one who was there in the beginning, 
above everything, powerful over everything. Nothing that was created was made without him. And here at Christmas, we celebrate him. We celebrate specifically the fact that that God that did that is coming to be with us. The true light is coming into the world. So today I want to look at five verses in this chapter, just the first five together, and kind of go a little deeper and think about what John is really telling us in his introduction to his gospel. And I want to look at three things, the power of the word, the gift of life, and the hope of the light. So let's dive right in and talk about the power of the word, the power of the word. Now, when I first moved here from England, uh, I assumed that because we both speak English, there would be no communication problems. It'd be great, I'd fit in really easily. But I very quickly learned that some words don't mean the same thing in England as they do in America. And so, as you can imagine, this led to a few embarrassing moments, the worst of which was in a Sunday school class that I was teaching. It, this is a really humiliating moment, so I'm being vulnerable with y'all. I need y'all to, to still love me. But I was teaching a lesson, and we were talking about the hope of Jesus. And I always like to put a video clip in for the kids, right, so that they can, they can kind of enjoy the lesson, have something they can connect with. Uh, and on this particular occasion, the, pas- the video clip I'd chosen for our passage was a scene from the movie Hook. Have, you, have any of you guys seen the movie Hook? Anybody? It's one of my favorite movies. It's quite old now, but it's got Robin Williams, and it's a story about Peter Pan after he's grown up, and he's forgotten all about Neverland, and he's become a lawyer. And the whole story is him kind of remembering who he really is. Uh, And so I show this clip in the class, we go through, I think it's awesome, I think, yes, they're going to love me here, this is going to be great. And then at the end of the clip, someone raises their hand, and they say, Pastor Andrew, it said the A word, and I'm thinking, A word? What's the A word? And I'm like thinking through my brain, trying to think of all the bad language I know, and hopefully find out what I've accidentally slipped in here, Um, and I just couldn't think of it. So at the end, I, I walked up to the kid and I said, hey, What's, what's the A word? And as kids do, we kind of mouthed out a word that I shall not repeat in this sacred space, but I can tell you it rhymed with the word pass. Now, I was humiliated, embarrassed, so embarrassed, because for me, for coming from England in my culture, that word doesn't carry the same weight that it does over here. So I immediately felt terrible that I didn't know that. I thought that mom was going to find me and she was going to end any kind of career I had in youth work. So It's very important that we understand what is meant by what we're saying, what words mean, because words carry power, and no word carries more power than the word, which John tells us about in this chapter. See, John wants us to catch here in the start of his gospel the power of the word. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. See, John wants us to understand who this story is about. He wants us to understand that when he talks to us about the word, when he talks to us about the story of Jesus, he is saying without question that this person is God. And John chooses his words to describe him very carefully. I want to read another section of scripture to you, and I want you to see if this sounds familiar at all, like John's introduction. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Do you catch the similarity between the opening of Genesis and the opening of John? John did too. And that's why he wrote his gospel the way he did. He is absolutely, absolutely trying to draw a connection between the word, between Jesus, and the God who created everything. That's why in both accounts it starts with, in the beginning. Both of them start in eternity past, before anything that was made was made. Both of them highlight that it's through God's power that everything that is came to be. We could go on and on and on, and we could pull this apart in a hundred different ways to see how John is trying to speak to his Jewish listeners. He's trying to speak to those that would read his gospel and have them understand this one who's coming into the world is not someone new. It's not a change in God's plan. He is the plan from the beginning. He was there. He's not using these words lightly. 
What I want you to see is that John is affirming two things. Firstly, he's affirming the fact that the Word is God. He is not lesser than God. He is God. He is the creator of everything that is. And the second thing he's doing is he's affirming that the story of Jesus is a part of this bigger story. You see, Christmas is about a lot more than just Jesus' birth. Certainly no less than that. It's an amazing event in and of itself. But it is one event in the scheme of an entire story that God has been working on since the beginning. Since Genesis chapter 3, God has been working to send a descendant of Eve and Adam who would crush the head of the serpent that betrayed them. That's Jesus. The promise is there right at the beginning. There's another word that John uses very purposefully here in chapter 1, and it's the word, the word. The Greek word for the word is logos. You may have heard it in church before, but we don't always understand this Greek word, this logos, right? We don't understand what it meant to people in the ancient world. John picked this word on purpose because of what it meant to those that were around him. And I think when we understand it, we'll catch something of what John's really saying. See, Logos, to the Greeks of the time, it was kind of a Greek philosophy, and what they thought about the Logos, the word, was that it was the organizing principle of creation. It was the principle of divine reason. What I mean by that is that they thought the Logos was kind of a concept that gave the blueprints for how everything is. The Logos is what explains the reason for why things are the way they are. And Greek philosophers spent years and years trying to understand the meaning of life, the reason for life, philosophizing and debating and arguing about what the Logos was. But at the heart of it, they all believed it was kind of the blueprint. It was the organizing thing. Jewish minds also had a lot of ideas about the Logos. It kind of bled over from Greek culture. And what Jews said about the Logos is that it's God's wisdom, God's law. They thought of the Logos as this principle again, except the principle was coming from God. But John does something that neither of those do, because neither the Jews nor the Greeks of the time understood the Logos as anything but a concept, logic. And what John says is, in the beginning, the Logos was with God and was God. See, in John's mind, the organizing principle of the whole universe is Jesus. It's not some idea, it's not some concept that we can all aspire to and hope to reason out. Jesus is the reason for everything that is. The Logos is the reason for everything. The Logos is the reason for our existence and our purpose. The Logos is God's wisdom and his word. And all those things are found in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the reason for everything. And we looked at this in Colossians just a few weeks ago. We said that all things were created by him and for him. He is the end goal. He is the prize. It's all for him. The reason for everything is Jesus. The cells in your body right now, your life, my life, the trees outside, the chemical makeup of the world that we live in. All of it is for God's glory through his son. So what does that mean for you and me, if this is who Jesus is? It means, first of all, we can't take Jesus for granted. Do you remember the tale of the prince and the pauper, where the prince and the pauper changed places because they looked alike, and eventually the friends of the pauper discover that who they thought was the pauper is actually the future king. And they gasp in bewilderment and they bend their knees, astounded that the king has come to be amongst them, has walked amongst them. Do you think that that's how we think about Jesus? When we think about the Advent story? When we think about this amazing God who created everything that is coming to be with us? Do we realize that the pauper is really a king? Do we realize that the baby is really God? Think about how deeply we all yearn for meaning in our lives, our purpose. We search for it. We scramble for it. And here in a manger, God has presented us with the reason for everything. The one who made everything. The one who gives you your identity and your definition and your purpose. Just sitting in a manger. 
And I think one of the saddest things in our culture here in the Western world is that often we really connect with Jesus as our friend and our teacher. I think we struggle a little bit to see him as he really is as God, as king. I urge you this Christmas season, one of the most beautiful things you can do as a family is spend some time reflecting on the story of Advent and realizing that it is the king amongst us, the creator God with us. We have some devotionals in our neighbor magazine, or you could find some online. You can look for ways to get together as a family and talk about the amazing story of a God who created everything and then entered into it. You can spend time outside of church, reading your Bible, praying together as a family, asking God to make himself known, make the Logos known to you. Be willing to trust him when he speaks things to you and calls to you. The king asks, bend the knee. Now this can all weigh very heavy on us because I realize that trying to live in God's grace and live up to these expectations of thinking of him rightly can be intimidating. We figure, how how are we going to do this? But that's why we need the gift of life. The gift of life. Now, we had a recent birth in the Griffiths family. My beautiful daughter, Annalisa, do we have a picture? There she is. She's really cute. (laughs) I love that little girl. And what I love about her story is her journey from being the picture on the left to the picture on the right. I find life absolutely fascinating when you go in for your scans and you see at the very earliest stage this life growing. And it blows your mind that something can come from two microscopic cells and form into this incredibly complex, gifted, and unique human being. It's amazing. When we would uh, go for our checkups, I would always ask Janae, can I, can I come to the appointment? Now, the appointment is really just for mommy and baby to make sure everything's going well. But for me, it was like, this is an opportunity to investigate and to ask the doctor all these questions that Janae doesn't really care about because she's just pregnant. She just wants to get to the end. And so we would go in, and I would, there would be magazines in the doctor's office that tell you how the baby's growing, what they're growing, you know, what's happening. And I'm like, Janae, look at this. It's amazing. Look what's happening. And she's like, yeah, no, we've done it twice. (laughs) And then we would go in and speak with our doctor, and he was always very kind. He would always say at the end, do you have any questions? And especially towards the end when my heavily pregnant wife just wanted to go home and put her feet up, I would say, I have a question. And I would ask all of these questions. I would be like, what can the baby sense? Can he hear my voice? Or she hear my voice? I would go through all these things because life is fascinating to me because I think life is an amazing, amazing thing and should be celebrated at every stage and we should look at it and marvel of what God has done through human bodies to create life like that. And in John's gospel, this is what John says. He says, in him, in the word, the logos was life and the life was the light of men. The word was life. In God was life. And God shared that life and directed that life towards us in being our light. I think he means a couple of things by this statement, this statement that in him was life and it was the light of men. First of all, I think that biological life is a gift from God. I absolutely firmly believe that the human race is not an accident. We did not come about by chance. We came about by the love and the thoughtfulness and the kindness of a God who created us. He crafted us in our mother's wombs, we're told in the psalm, that he put us together piece by piece. God breathed life into Adam and Eve in the garden, and he breathes life into us as we enter the world. Secondly, I think that John is not just talking about biological life, but he's talking about spiritual life. Because you and I have been created in the image of God, and so unlike every other creature in all of creation, there's something special about us. We can know God. We can relate to God. We can have a relationship with him because we are spiritually alive. Because God has made us to be his family. We are the only creature in creation that can do this. No one else. There is a privilege and a gift to human beings that was excluded everything else that God made our light. 
John says uh, in his 10th chapter, when he's talking about something Jesus was saying, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, Jesus is telling us that his purpose in coming into the world was to give us deeper life, more life, clear life. Because although we were created, you and I, for spiritual life, through our choices, through our attitudes, and through the facts of our existence, we actually are born spiritually dead because of sin. And Jesus has come to give us the spiritual life that he always intended us to have that we lost. When he says living life abundantly, he wants to give life abundantly. Normally our minds go to things like, well, he's going to bless me with more finances or with more experiences or we're going to go the world over and do all these different things that I've never done. But most of the time when we think about life abundant, we're thinking about a lot of things that are not really living. This is what C.S. Lewis says about this struggle. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. And like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. The lives that you and I sell for is often much, much less than what God intends and desires for us. And so that is why the word came into the world, to be our light, to guide us, to help us to see what we were made for, to bring us out of darkness and into light. God desires more for us than we desire for ourselves. God wants to take you out of the slums to a vacation at the sea. We need to stop bringing excuses to the throne of God as to why we don't want to live the way that he's laid out, why we don't want to live in him, with him. I don't say that as a criticism because the person who does that the most in this room is me. There's no one in this room who is more apt to come up with an excuse as to why I can't do the thing that God has asked me to do than me. And I'll say things like, well, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit with my schedule. I want to be with my family and I want to do this and this. And I want to make sure that I'm, you know, I have time for me. But the truth is, is that most of the things that I look to for living are not really living. Jesus wants to bring us joy. He wants to bring us hope. For you, maybe serving somewhere in church is what God's calling you to. Maybe that's what God desires for you, to find life in following him more closely. Maybe it's serving students. I serve students because I firmly believe that God has called me to do this to bring me life. Because in doing it, I will see more of him, I will know more of him, and therefore I will know more of what I was made for. Making time to serve as a family together somewhere. Lazarus House, the food pantry. There's lots of different places in our area, in our community, amongst our neighbors. And when we go and serve you will learn more about God. God will bring you life through it. God will use every minute, every prayer to bring you life that you never knew because he came to bring life abundantly. John's ultimate point is that there's no life without Jesus. Not really. And this is why we need the hope of the light. The hope of the light. John tells us in verse five, as he's closing out this initial section, he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. His kind of sum up of these introductory thoughts, these first things that he's telling us about Jesus, about the word, is that he is a light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. He's the one who breathed life into us. He's the one who leads us. And there's a similar verse that we read quite often at Christmas that links to this idea, and it's in Isaiah 9, 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. The first observation here is light and dark are not equal. There's clearly a winner in this battle, and it's light. Have you ever been in your house in a power cut when all the lights have gone out, and you light a candle, and immediately... 
If you're in the pitch dark, even that one tiny candle flame will add light to the whole room. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be the brightest ever and you'll see everything as well as you could in daylight, but my point is that even a small amount of light dramatically changes darkness. Darkness cannot eclipse it. It cannot get over it. Where light is, it literally drives darkness away. It pushes it out, and the darkness cannot overcome that light. This is the hope of Jesus, is that the darkness we feel in our lives, the pain, the suffering, the questions, Jesus will drive those away. That's why he came. So that when we feel in darkness, we will have a hope that there is a light that is shining in that darkness, and the darkness can't overcome it. If you've ever asked the question, God, what are you doing about all the darkness in this world? God's reply would be, I gave you my son. That's what he did about darkness, is he gave us his son to be the one who we can hope in and run to and find security in. But light can sometimes hurt our eyes when we've been in the dark too long. Sometimes when the light comes on, we squint and it's painful to look at. It's a little bit the same with Jesus. Is when this light shines in the darkness, sometimes it's brighter than anything we've ever seen. And so it makes us a little apprehensive, a little uncomfortable. But the truth is, he's good. He's shining there for you and for me. And we need to embrace him so that we will see all of his goodness, all of his kindness, everything that he has been intending to do since Genesis 3. Second thing is that the good news is God has done this for you. He is the light shining in the darkness, not you. That's a really great thing. Because it means that I don't have to somehow find a way to get myself out of my darkness. That if I hope in him, he will light the way. He will do everything that's necessary. That's my favorite thing about the gospel, is it's pure grace. We're not knocking on God's door saying, please, please, help me, I'm in darkness. What we're doing is, we're beholding as Jesus walks into the room without us asking, without us doing anything that merited him coming and dispelling every darkness in that room. And he did that because he loves you, because he's dedicated to you. This God that we talk about every Sunday and we investigate and we think about and we talk about this high theology and all these amazing things about him, all of us should point us to the, the simple fact that he loves us so, so much. That he's for us and not against us. As Jesus was born, we're told of this event near to where he was born in Luke. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. When I read this story each year, I can't help but think that here are a group of shepherds in literal darkness, the darkness of night, in a field, there's no street lights in those days, just darkness, maybe a few candles. And into that darkness, the glory of God shone around and illuminated the whole area, turning night into day. And they couldn't behold it. It was so bright, they were afraid. But the angel encourages him, I've got good news of great joy. I want to show you a picture really quickly. Um, Do you recognize either of the women in this photo? Anybody? A couple of people. Yes, smart guy in the back. Yes, oh my gosh, he got it. Yes, this is a picture of Helen Keller uh, and a woman named Anne Sullivan. Now, if you don't know Helen Keller's story, most of us have had some part of it. Helen Keller was born a healthy baby. She was a great baby, but at 18 months, she caught what doctors now believe was a strain of meningitis. And it left her blind, and it left her deaf. Two of the primary ways in which we communicate in this world, gone. Understand our world, gone. Helen Keller quite literally lived in darkness. 
And as a young gal, her parents tried to help her as best they could, find ways to help her communicate. But even as a seven-year-old gal, she was so frustrated and downcast because she couldn't engage with the world anymore. And to Ann Sullivan, the lady on the right. Ann Sullivan was a teacher. And she heard about Helen Keller's situation and story, and she traveled to come be with her. And Ann Sullivan dedicated her life, and I do mean her life, to helping Helen Keller learn how to enjoy the world around her. She became Helen's light in the darkness. Within months of meeting Helen Keller, as miraculous as it sounds, she had taught her how to communicate. Helen could now have conversations with people. And she stuck with her for years, for decades, until her death, constantly choosing to be the light in Helen's darkness, to help her know the world around her. What we all need as people is a light that will shine in the darkness. What we need is someone who will love us and care for us and dedicate themselves to us so that when we are in darkness, we have hope that it won't be forever. That there is a light shining in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. My friends, this morning I want you to see on the first week of Advent, I want you to have this hope on the first week of Advent that God has given you the power of the word, the gift of life, and the hope of his son, Jesus. It's what we need. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of your son who is power and wisdom and goodness and hope. And thank you that this season, for these next few weeks, we will celebrate one of the greatest events in human history where you became a man and walked among us and dedicated yourself to dispelling the darkness in our lives. And we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we get to do something we don't always get to do that's special, a very significant moment. On the first week of Advent, we're going to take communion together. We're going to come to the Lord's table. And this is an opportunity for us to linger and dwell on who Jesus really is and know that that baby that sat in that manger had come to one day give his body and his blood to shine brighter than ever on a cross, on a hill, 2,000 years ago. So this morning we're going to hand this out. I want you to hold on to it and pray and ask God to show himself to you and then we will take the elements together. We will eat the bread together and we will drink the cup together. And I want you to dwell on this hope that Jesus is for you. Let me pray for our time of communion and then we will enter in. Father, thank you for this moment to linger, to not rush out, but to consider your son who came to give, to, came to give his life for us. We love him so very much. And we pray that you would make him known to us this morning through this time. Amen.